Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Good evening, wildlings. Now, we all love a good movie. Just for a short time, we get to turn off our worries and the stress of the outside world and watch someone act out scenarios that we'd never be capable of, or fulfill fantasies, or reenact something that we find fascinating. Sometimes, however, keeping up a place where this indulgence is possible can be a stressful, even dangerous living, as in tonight's terrible theatrical tale, I'm a Cinema Usher. We have some strange rules. Part 2. By Drunken Swordsman. My name is Sean. I've been a cinema usher for three years now. My cinema has rules that you never ever break no matter how strange or downright insane they sound. If you're confused you should go back and probably start at the beginning. Some rules are harder to follow than the others and some come up more often. Rule number four is one of the rarer ones, and I thank God for that. Rule number four. If the lights go out when you're cleaning a room, take a seat. A movie will play. You have to watch till the end. Don't look away from the screen, no matter what you see or hear. This is the rule that gave me the most anxiety when I read it. Having already had a run-in with rules one and two, I knew just how serious following our commandments, or failing to do so, could be. My experience with rule number four was when I was cleaning out room one after a movie. Without warning, it happened. The thing that I'd been dreading for months at that point. The lights went out. It wasn't a pop like a light bulb going off one second, I was in a well-lit room, and the next... I was standing in pitch blackness. I froze. Even though I'd been mentally preparing myself for this for weeks, I froze. Take a seat, damn you, take a seat. Finally, my limbs obeyed my mind. I leapt for where I hoped the nearest row was and rammed myself down into a place. Just in time. The screen lit up, filling with static before resolving into the image of a dark, dank cellar. The image quality was ancient, like some Super 8 film from the 90s. Through the grainy screen I could make out that there was a single chair in the center of the room, and tied to it was a young man. He was struggling against his bonds and I could tell that he was injured. Narrow streams of blood streamed down his face from an injury above his brow, and his arms were rubbed raw from the ropes. There was something terribly familiar about the prisoner. Not his face, I'd, I'd never seen that in my life, but his clothes. I froze as I heard something move behind me. It was the creak of a theater chair. My back crawled. Someone... Something had just sat down behind me. It took all my willpower not to swivel around or to jump from my seat and make a break for the entrance. I fixed my eyes on the screen, praying for this to be over soon. The man on screen had stopped struggling. He was looking at something behind the camera. It took me a second to realize that he had to be watching the cameraman. I almost jumped from my seat as a voice whispered behind me. What did that do, huh? The voice was low, practically an inaudible whisper. It sounded human, almost. But I knew immediately that it was anything but. I can't explain precisely how, but it was something about the cadence of the thing's speech. Almost as if its throat wasn't quite made for human language. And it just did its best at mimicking what it had heard. Even worse, the voice was coming from slightly above me, not directly behind. Whatever was in that chair behind me, it had to be absolutely massive when standing up. Should I answer? Should I just keep watching? The rules hadn't told me about that. 
I remained silent, gripping the armrests to stop myself from shaking, eyes fixed forward toward the screen. The camera was moving as the person carrying it approached his prisoner. The man in the chair was trying desperately to recoil, but his binds were too tight for anything but the slightest movement. And as the camera got closer, I recognized what was so horribly familiar about him. His clothes. He was wearing a cinema uniform. My cinema's uniform. Whispered the thing sitting behind me. Sadistic irony dripped from every word. It was playing with me. I didn't answer. The movie went on for about a half hour. I won't tell you exactly what I saw. I don't want to think about it more than I absolutely have to. I'm not sure that stuff would be allowed on this site anyway, not even in description. Suffice it to say, I wouldn't wish such a fate on my worst enemy. At one point, I retched and vomited all over myself and the floor. As my stomach convulsed, I almost took my eyes off the screen, and at that moment I felt the thing's hot, stinking breath on my back. It wanted me to look away. It wanted me to give in. I looked up again, fixing my eyes on the gruesome scene playing out on screen. The thing behind me spoke only once more before the lights came on as abruptly as they had turned off. It sounded frustrated, angry even. I wish I could end the story there, but unfortunately, there's just a bit more to it. Because the guy on screen had been a worker here. Because he had died for breaking a rule. Because David hadn't told us everything, instead keeping us on some sort of bullshit need-to-know basis. Someone had suffered a fate worse than death because of his secrecy, and I would have him explain himself. Still covered in my own sick and cold sweat, I stormed through the lobby, ignoring the disgusted looks of the customers there. I slammed into the office, and David looked up calmly from his desk. Four or eleven? Rule four. Good. Good? Good? You knew what the risk was. You knew what could happen, but you didn't tell anyone. That guy I saw, the, oh, the things it did to... You could have stopped that. David sighed tiredly. It's better this way, Sean. What? How can it possibly be? Let me explain something to you, David said getting up to stand eye to eye with me. There was a hint of steel in his voice now and a flash of suppressed anger in his look. I shut up. Some things can be avoided if you know about them. Room three is like that. If you know what it wants and how it'll try to get it, it's easier not to fall for it. But some things, Sean, some things only get stronger the more you know about them. You can avoid breaking rule number four with what you know right now. You just need to keep watching. But the more you know about it, the more direct the thing in that room can be in its attempt to get you to look away. And the last guy, the one I saw on the screen? You knew too much. Even more than you do now. That was a mistake. That I'll never repeat, and a lesson that I'm not going to forget. There's a threshold, Sean, that I can't allow anyone to cross. If you know too much, no amount of willpower or strength will keep your eyes on that screen. Rule number five, if you encounter a room where all customers are looking directly at you and smiling, 
inform the manager immediately. Rule 5 is the one which has raised the most questions in my mind about this cinema and my work. My encounter with it occurred about a year and a half into my time here. Something you should know about the work of a cinema usher. We need to check that every movie is running smoothly, uh, with working subtitles and so on. We're only obliged to do so at the beginning of each projection, but we have some free time during our shift. So we like to check in at random to make sure everything's going all right. Unfortunately, it's exactly because of this that I entered room five one day, only to almost have a heart attack as I realized that every single person inside was looking me dead in the eye, smiling eerily. Taking care not to blink, I slowly backed out of the room. The customers never broke eye contact, not even to blink themselves. The second that I was in the relative safety of the lobby, I ran over to David who was talking with a customer at our small bar. Rule 5, I said once I reached him. David immediately went pale. The customer, a young attractive woman, looked over at him in confusion. Excuse me, David muttered in her direction before turning to me. Which room? Five. Okay, follow me. We ran over to the room. Once inside, David, gest David gestured for me to remain at the bottom of the row of seats. Stay here. He didn't need to tell me twice. This room, full of customers, was deadly quiet, every head silently turning to follow David as he walked in front of the screen and stopped in the middle of the room. What do you want? He said to the room at large. And every person in the room opened their mouth in unison and said in a perfect chorus, Hello, Hello manager, 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 long, 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 Cut the crap, David growled. I know your game. What do you want this time? The room laughed in chilling synchrony. <laughs> <laughs> Always, so always, so always, 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 the crowd answered, I, 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 I want you, you, you to open, open room, room three, 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 right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now. David went pale. No, ask something else. There are lines I will not cross. There are rules. The things behind the eyes of the crowd laughed as one. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, 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 precious, yes, precious rules. Do you think, do you they, think they stop and stop and stop and They stop, they stop, they stop, they stop, they stop, they stop, they only delay, 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 delay. Giving me information for free, David said sarcastically. You've changed since last we talked. I only I tell you what you already know. And my price is not to change. You will open room three, 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 again, again, again. For the first time, David hesitated. Only for a second. But the things noticed, and they laughed cruelly at him. I've already told you, I won't do it. That rule is never broken, he said finally. Do you forget our history? After a mere year, years, 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 the crowd sneered. The fate, 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 the You know what happens to the moment my price is not do you see to see to see this is the meaningless resistance for the sacrifice that was made because of your mistake? I don't atone, David hissed, and I made no mistake. Would the one who you miss so dearly agree? I think not. One of the things intoned, there was a charged silence. Then the crowd spoke again. The price is paid, 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 these people, these are, people safe. are safe. David blinked in confusion. What? 
What price? The anguish of your remembrance as well as the unanswered questions that were that play the serpent of yours. Those were those were those were those You bastard, David whispered. You fucking Basil next week. Man and man and man and man. David stormed out of the room without another word. The crowd followed him with their gaze and then fixed it upon me. A smile, a nod, then the crowd looked up as one and shed their identical behavior. A hidden tension in the room was released. They were free. Rule number six. If a customer hears noises in the air ducts, Assure them that you will look into it. Take one of the packages marked R6 from behind the bar, enter the air ducts through the garbage room, and place the contents of the package at least 10 meters away from the entrance. Leave the air ducts as fast as possible. This is actually one of the easiest rules to follow, although the time limit is worrying at first. It's also one of the most commonly employed, usually coming up about uh, once a week. Thankfully, I've never seen anyone fail to uphold it. The first time I had to feed the thing in the air ducts was a very busy shift. We had premiered The Rise of Skywalker a few days before, and we were still fairly swamped by the initial crowds of customers. I was cleaning up the lobby of the ever-present spilled popcorn when an angry-looking young man wearing a Star Wars t-shirt stormed over to me. Good day, sir. How may I be? I began. Yeah, man. Whatever. He cut me off immediately. Could you fix your damn air con, dude? There's something banging around in there near the grill in our room. I didn't pay for this kind of shit. I clenched my teeth to control my temper at the man's manners, but I managed to maintain my calm. Yes, sir. Of course. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. David will probably forgive you for letting a room of people die at the hands of God knows what, but he won't allow you to be rude to customers. He's just like that. After the customer had stocked off again, I got one of the marked packages from behind the bar. It was strangely heavy and I could feel moisture seeping out from inside it. Doing my best to ignore it, I crossed over to the garbage room and opened the grill covering the air ducts. I could hear whatever the customer had been complaining about. A fast, uh, tip-tip-tappy sound like fingers drumming endlessly against the sides of the duct. My skin crawled. It was uncomfortably too close to the sound of dozens of long, thin legs. I took a deep breath and crawled into the chute. The air inside was cold and drafty, the passage was tight, and I was forced to go prone, propelling myself on my elbows and knees. Crawling forward, I could see by the dim light that there was a pile of something up ahead, around the ten meter mark. As I reached it, I groaned under my breath. In the chute before me lay a pile of gnawed animal bones. With shaking fingers, I undid the wrapping on my package and dropped a whole chicken onto the top of the pile of remains. The sounds in the chute stopped. I held my breath. Then it returned. Faster, tip-tap, tip-tap, louder than before, a frantic, hungry, staccato rhythm. Terror and adrenaline flooding my brain, I scooted back down towards the mouth of the passage. How long had I been in there? How long did I have left? 30 seconds? 20? The clattering of legs mixed now with a scraping sound as something chitinous and heavy dragged itself down the corridor towards the food and towards me. And finally, my legs met the end of the duct. Kicking frantically, I dropped down to the floor of the garbage room and slammed the grill shut. The clattering inside had finally stopped. Listening carefully, I could make out the sounds of tearing flesh. And this is one of the easiest rules. Uh-huh. So maybe the next time you're miffed about the dress code or the customer-first policy when dealing with obnoxious twats at work, remember 
it can always be worse. Stay scary, my wildlings. Always stick by the exits and make the most of your nights.